Hey everyone, welcome back to Faxpire. Today we're diving into the wild, fascinating world of the Sukhoi Su-37, a Russian fighter jet that's equal parts engineering marvel and technological enigma. This isn't just another warplane, it's a beast that pushed the boundaries of what we thought was possible in the skies. Over the next hour or so, we're going to unpack a ton of mind-blowing, little-known facts about this jet, spanning science, history, nature, space, technology, and even a dash of human psychology. Trust me, by the end of this, you'll see the Su-37 in a whole new light. So grab a snack, get comfy, and let's take flight into this incredible story. Let's kick things off with the basics. The Su-37, nicknamed the Terminator, not to be confused with Arnold Schwarzenegger's iconic cyborg, is a single-seat, twin-engine fighter jet developed by Russia's Sukhoi Design Bureau. It's part of the legendary flanker family, which started with the Su-27 back in the Soviet era. But here's the kicker, the Su-37 wasn't just an upgrade. It was a radical experiment, a technology demonstrator, built to test the limits of aerial combat. First flown in April 1996, this jet was designed to do things no other aircraft could, and it left a mark on aviation history that's still felt today. So, what makes it so special? Let's dive into the science behind this gravity-defying machine. Picture this. You're at an air show, and a jet screams across the sky. Suddenly, it pulls up, flips backward in a full 360-degree somersault, and keeps flying like nothing happened. That's the Su-37 performing its signature cool bit maneuver, and it's all thanks to a scientific breakthrough called thrust vectoring. Now, thrust vectoring isn't just a fancy term, it's pure physics in action. Most fighter jets rely on their wings and control surfaces like ailerons and rudders to maneuver. But the Su-37, it's got nozzles on its engines that can tilt and redirect the exhaust. Imagine pointing a fire hose straight ahead, then swinging it side to side. That's the kind of control this jet has. Those engines, by the way, are Lyulka AL31 FP turbofans, each pumping out over 30,000 pounds of thrust. When those nozzles move, they shift the jet's direction instantly, letting it twist and turn in ways that defy normal aerodynamics. But why does this matter? Well, in a dogfight, those intense, close-range aerial battles, maneuverability is everything. The Su-37 can pull off stunts like the Cobra maneuver, where it rears up to a near-vertical angle, slows almost to a stall, then drops back into level flight. It's like a Cobra striking at prey, and it could throw off an enemy pilot's aim or force them to overshoot. The science here is all about controlling airflow and momentum. At those extreme angles, most planes would lose lift and plummet, but the Su-37's thrust vectoring keeps it stable, bending the laws of physics to its will. It's not just cool, it's a game changer in combat. Now, let's zoom out a bit and talk history, because the Su-37 didn't just appear out of nowhere. Its story starts in the Cold War a time when the Soviet Union and the United States were locked in a technological arms race. The Su-27, the Su-37's ancestor, was born in the late 1970s to counter America's F-15 Eagle. The Soviets wanted a fighter that could outfly anything the West had, and Sukhoi delivered. By the 1990s, though, the Soviet Union had collapsed, and Russia was in chaos, economically, politically, you name it. Funding for new military projects dried up, and that's where the Su-37's tale gets gritty. Sukhoi didn't have the government cash to keep this project alive, so they dug into their own pockets, using profits from selling Su-27S to countries like China and Vietnam. That's right, this jet was a passion project, a gamble that Sukhoi took because they believed in its potential. The first prototype, originally in Su-27M airframe known as T-10M11, was retrofitted with those thrust vectoring engines and took to the skies at Zhukovsky Airfield outside Moscow. Test pilot Yevgeny Frolov was at the controls, and over the next few years, he and the team pushed the Su-37 to its limits. They showcased it at air shows like Farnborough in 1996 and Paris in 1997, wowing crowds and military brass alike. But here's the twist. Despite all that hype, only one Su-37 was ever built. One. It never went into full production. Why? We'll get to that later, but for now, let's just say history had other plans. Speaking of history, let's take a detour into nature, because the Su-37's design draws some wild parallels with the animal kingdom. Those forward-swept wings and thrust-vectoring nozzles, they're not unlike the adaptations of a bird of prey, specifically the golden eagle, or Berkut in Russian. Sukhoi actually named another experimental jet the Su-47 after this bird, but the Su-37 shares some of that DNA. Golden Eagles are masters of agility, able to dive at speeds over 200 miles per hour and pivot mid-flight to snatch prey. 
Their wings are broad and flexible, letting them soar, hover, or twist with precision. Sound familiar? The Su-37's ability to shift its thrust and dance through the sky mirrors that natural agility. And it's not just eagles. Think about how dolphins use their tails to propel and steer through water. That's thrust vectoring in nature, redirecting force to change direction on a dime. Engineers at Sukhoi weren't copying animals directly, of course, but they were tapping into the same principles of fluid dynamics. Air and water aren't so different when it comes to movement. The jet's supermaneuverability, as they called it, was about breaking free from the rigid flight paths of traditional aircraft, much like a predator adapting to its environment. It's a reminder that some of our most advanced tech has roots in the natural world, even if we don't always notice it. Now let's blast off into space. Well, not literally, but the Su-37's capabilities flirt with the edges of Earth's atmosphere, and that's worth exploring. Fighter jets like this one operate in what's called the transonic and supersonic regime, speeds around and above Mach 1, the sound barrier. The Su-37 could hit Mach 2.25, or about 1,700 miles per hour, thanks to those powerful engines. At that speed, you're not just flying, you're punching through the air so fast it compresses into shockwaves. Pilots feel it as a jolt when they break the barrier, and on the ground, you hear it as a sonic boom. But here's the crazy part. At high altitudes, say 40,000 feet or more, the air gets thin, and the line between atmosphere and space starts to blur. The Su-37 wasn't a spacecraft, but its performance pushed it into a realm where aerodynamics meets the vacuum-like conditions of near space. During test flights, it climbed to over 60,000 feet, where the sky darkens and the curvature of the Earth comes into view. That's not low Earth orbit. Satellites start at about 600 miles up, but it's close enough to give pilots a taste of the void. And those thrust venturing engines, they help the jet stay controllable even as air pressure dropped, a feat that ties into the same tech we use for spacebound vehicles like the X-37B, which maneuvers with thrusters in orbit. The Su-37 was a bridge between sky and stars, even if it never left the planet. Let's pivot to technology now, because the Su-37 was a showcase of cutting edge innovation, some of which still influences fighter jets today. Beyond thrust vectoring, this plane packed a digital fly-by-wire system. That's a mouthful, so let me break it down. In older planes, pilots controlled the wings and rudders through mechanical cables, pull a stick, and a wire moves a flap. Fly-by-wire replaces that with electronics. The pilot's inputs go to a computer, which calculates the best way to adjust the plane's surfaces. Or, in the Su-37's case, it's engine nozzles too. It's like upgrading from a manual typewriter to a smartphone. The result? smoother, faster responses, and the ability to pull off those insane maneuvers without the jet spinning out of control. The cockpit was another tech marvel. It featured a glass display, think high-tech screens instead of analog dials, giving the pilot real-time data on speed, altitude, and targets. And the radar? The N11M bar system could track multiple enemies at once, even at long range, while guiding missiles to their mark. This wasn't just a fighter, it was a flying command center. Sukhoi even tested side-stick controllers, like a video game joystick, to make flying more intuitive. That tech trickled down to later jets like the Su-35 and Su-57, Russia's fifth-generation stealth fighter. The Su-37 was a proving ground, a lab in the sky that shaped the future of aerial warfare. But technology doesn't exist in a vacuum. Let's talk human psychology, because the Su-37 wasn't just about machines, it was about the pilots who flew it. Imagine you're strapped into this thing pulling a cool bit at an air show with thousands watching. Your heart's racing, adrenaline's pumping, and you're trusting your life to a computer and some swiveling nozzles. That takes a special kind of mindset. Test pilots like Yevgeny Frolov weren't just skilled, they were fearless, with a psychological edge that let them push boundaries most people would shy away from. There's a concept in psychology called flow state, you know, that zone where you're so focused everything else fades away. For fighter pilots, it's a survival tool. During those high-G maneuvers where the force of gravity multiplies and presses you into your seat, your brain has to process split-second decisions. The Su-37's fly-by-wire system helped pilots stay in that flow, reducing the mental load so they could focus on strategy, not just keeping the plane aloft. But it also played into something deeper, the human drive to conquer the impossible. Every time the Su-37 flipped or stalled mid-air, it was a middle finger to gravity, a testament to what we're capable of when we pair guts with ingenuity. Let's circle back to history for a moment because the Su-37's story is an all-triumph. It's got a bittersweet edge. After dazzling the world at air shows, the jet's fate took a turn. On December 19, 2002, that lone prototype crashed near Moscow during a high-G test flight. The left tailplane snapped off mid-maneuver and the plane went down. 
Pilot Yuri Vashuk ejected safely, thank goodness, but the investigation revealed a harsh truth. Six years of pushing the airframe beyond its limits had caused structural fatigue. The Sup-37 had been flown hard, too hard, and it paid the price. That crash marked the end of the line. The Russian Air Force never ordered more, partly because the economy was still shaky, and partly because Sukhoi shifted focus to other projects. But here's the silver lining. The Su-37 wasn't a failure. It was a stepping stone. Its thrust vectoring tech found a home in the Su-30 MKI, built for India, and the Su-35, a mainstay of Russia's modern fleet. Even the Su-57, Russia's stealth fighter, owes a debt to the Terminator. In a way, the Su-37 lived on, its DNA woven into the next generation of warplanes. Now, let's dig into some lesser-known facts because the Su-37 is full of surprises. Did you know it was almost a strike fighter? Back in the early 1990s, Sukhoi toyed with making it a ground attack plane, not just an air superiority champ. They tested it with precision bombs and missiles, aiming to give it a dual role. That didn't pan out. The focus stayed on dogfighting, but it shows how versatile the design was. Another tidbit, the jet's thrust vectoring nozzles weren't fully active on its first flights. For the initial five tests, they were fixed, and only later did Sukhoi unlock their full potential. It's like they were teasing out the jet's true power step by step. Here's one more. The Suk-37 stole the show at Farnborough, not just with its moves, but with its timing. It arrived late, six days into the event, without proper permits. Test pilot Frolov had to beg for a chance to fly, and it took intervention from Russia's deputy prime minister to get him in the air. When he finally did, jaws dropped. That chaotic debut only added to the jet's legend. It was a rebel, even among its own creators. Let's shift gears to science again, because the Su-37's engines deserve a closer look. Those AL-31 FP turbofans weren't just powerful, they were a leap in materials science. The nozzles used heat-resistant alloys to withstand temperatures over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the kind of heat that would melt lesser metals. Inside, turbine blades spun at insane speeds, bathed in scorching exhaust, yet they held together thanks to advanced cooling techniques. Air was channeled through tiny holes in the blades, creating a protective layer, a bit like sweat cooling your skin on a hot day. This let the engines run hotter and more efficiently, squeezing out every ounce of thrust. In the aerodynamics, the Su-37's airframe was a mix of aluminum-lithium alloys and carbon fiber composites, lightweight yet strong, cutting drag while handling stress. During a cold bit, the jet hit angles of attack over 150 degrees, way beyond what most planes can manage. Angle of attack is just how steeply the nose points up relative to the airflow, and at those extremes, the wings should have stalled. But the thrust vectoring and fly-by-wire kept it flying, rewriting the rule book on what a jet could endure. Back to nature for a sec, because the Su-37's agility has an eerie echo in the insect world. Ever watch a dragonfly dart around? Those little hunters can hover, flip, and chase prey with precision thanks to four wings they control independently. The Suk 37's thrust vectoring gave it a similar freedom, untethering it from the predictable paths of traditional jets. It's almost like Sukhoi bottled the essence of a dragonfly and scaled it up to a 40,000 pound war machine. Nature and tech colliding again, it's a theme that keeps popping up. Let's explore space one more time because the Su 37's high altitude antics tie into a bigger cosmic picture. At 60,000 feet, it was brushing the stratosphere, where weather fades and the air is too thin for most planes to function. That's a playground for science. Meteorologists use similar altitudes to study atmospheric layers, and the jet's data from those heights could have informed climate models or even spacecraft re-entry. Plus, its speed and climb rate, over 1,000 feet per second, mirrored the ascent of early space planes like the X-15. The Su-37 wasn't built for space, but it danced on the edge of it, a terrestrial cousin to those orbital pioneers. Technology-wise, let's spotlight the radar again. The N11 MBARS wasn't just any system, it was phased data, meaning it used electronic steering instead of a moving dish. That let it scan the sky faster and track up to 15 targets simultaneously, all while feeding data to the pilot's helmet mount display. Pair that with long-range missiles like the R-77 and the Su-37 could strike from beyond visual range, a predator picking off prey before they even knew it was there. This wasn't sci-fi, it was real, and it set the stage for today's networked warfare, where jets talk to satellites and drones in real time. Human psychology comes back into play here too. The Su-37 wasn't just a tool, it was a symbol. At air shows, it wasn't just pilots and engineers watching, it was rival nations, potential buyers, and everyday folks. Russia was flexing its muscles, saying, we're still in the game, even after the Soviet collapse. 
That psychological warfare on a grand scale, projecting power through spectacle. For the pilots, it was personal. Mastering this jet meant joining an elite club, a badge of honor that fed into their identity. And for us watching, it taps into our love of the extraordinary, that thrill of seeing something defy the odds. Let's wrap this up with a final historical lens. The Su-37's legacy isn't just in its tech. It's in its ambition. It came at a time when Russia was rebuilding, when Sukhoi bet big on a dream. It didn't win export deals, Brazil and South Korea passed, and India went with the Su-30 MKI instead. But it proved something. It showed that innovation doesn't need a big budget or a stable government, just vision and grit. When that prototype crashed, it wasn't the end. It was a handoff. The Su-35, Su-57, even India's Air Force all carry pieces of the Terminator's spirit. So, what's the takeaway? The Su-37 was more than a jet. It was a fusion of science, history, and human daring. It bent physics, echoed nature, grazed space, and rewrote technology, all while reflecting the psyche of its creators and pilots. One prototype, a handful of flights, and a crash couldn't erase its impact. Next time you hear a jet roar overhead, think of the Suk-37, the Terminator that didn't just fly, but soared beyond what anyone thought possible. Thanks for sticking with me on this epic ride. If you love diving into the Su-37's world, hit that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell for more deep dives like this. What's your favorite fact about this jet? Drop it in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, keep looking up, and I'll see you in the skies.